Today I'm going to be talking about this control board. Yes, it is a tiny 3D printer control board about the size of a NEMA 17 motor that fits on your tool head. This device has saved me countless hours of crimping and rewiring printers because it reduces the amount of wires from your tool head to your main control board from around 15 to 20 down to 4. If you think about all the crimps that saves, it's a huge time savings. If you're anything like me, um, I'll build a 3D printer mechanically so it's complete, but then the wiring just takes so much time and is just a drain on, on my energy. So I end up letting it drag out for days or weeks. Fortunately with this, it simplifies a lot of that wiring and gives you some additional other cool features. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about how those uh, boards work basics on how to set it up and some details about the different versions so that you can decide if you want to pick one up for your printer. Let's go through an example of why I find the clipper tool headboard to be especially useful. If we look at the generic 3D printer, you're going to most likely have almost all of these devices on the left. A hot end, stepper motor, hot end fan, part cooling fan, some sort of Z probe, and then potentially an X end stop switch. Other options you know, that may be included are, say, a chamber thermistor or a filament runout switch. When you're looking at all these wires, they all have to get from your tool head that's moving around to your control board. And at least how Vorons do this is we run wires through the cable chains. In a V2, you're going to have three cable chains that add up to around a meter in length. Most of the devices that you receive for your 3D printer aren't going to include a meter of wire and if they do they're generally not motion rated wire. For each wire you're going to add an inline crimp before the cable chain so that's three crimps per wire. If any of the crimps are bad that ends up being a, a crimp you have to diagnose whether it's a thermistor failure or an overheating wire crimp from say a hot end cartridge. Those can be incredibly frustrating to diagnose so it's one of the main reasons why um, going to the clipper tool headboard is really useful. Now let's look at the same scenario, but with the clipper tool headboard. If you see all of those devices route directly to the tool headboard, the nice thing is that since that board is riding along on the tool head itself, you don't have to worry about using motion rated wires from those devices to the tool headboard. So instead of having three crimps, you can just get one crimp. That really simplifies things. And as well, since everything's packaged on the tool head board itself, you can do all that crimping and wiring directly on your desk. Then you run four wires from that tool head board through your cable chain or down your Bowden tube to the Raspberry Pi with a can hat on top. What this does is the uh, microcontroller on the clipper tool head board communicates through CAN protocol to this can hat that transmits that data back into something that Clipper can read. CAN bus is something that's used in different industries for a reliable, robust protocol. It's a little bit overkill for what we're using it here, but it's reliable, so it's good to use. This CAN hat is only about $15 on um, Amazon or AliExpress, and you know it's, it's easy to pick up. You may be asking, can I use the CAN ports that are on my Octopus or Spider control boards? And for now, the answer is no because Clipper needs to be able to directly communicate with every microcontroller that is in this system. And if you would say communicate from USB from the Raspberry Pi to a Octopus board, and then CAN from Octopus to the Clipper toolhead board, it would have to go through another microcontroller. And Clipper is not set up for that right now. Now that we've looked at how everything fits together, let's go ahead and look at the circuit boards themselves and see the different connectors we have. On the left, we have version 0.5, which you can see there in the upper right. And then on the right, we have 0.61. 0.5 is the version that has been available, you know, a year, maybe two years ago, and was available before the pandemic. Um, 0.61 is the newer version that has some additional features. Um, it's more expensive, but a lot of that is due to increased component costs due to shortages. We're going to go around counterclockwise starting from the top and look at each of the different connectors we have here. On the top we have this um, main connector which is a 2x2 two two Molex. Um, it is identical on both models and that is what 
transmits the uh, 24 volt to ground and then the two uh, CAN data lines. Notice I said 24 volts um, and not 12 volts. While potentially this might work at 12 volts, I really don't recommend using 20, or 12 volts at all with any of these tool headboards. The MOSFETs are a lot smaller than what you'd have on a normal control board, and they work fine for you know 24 volts where the current is lower. But as you go to 12 volts, I'd be really concerned that you may overload the MOSFETs. This also comes into play when we're talking about higher wattage hot ends, even at 24 volts, like maybe the Rapido or the, um, you know, anything higher than say 50 or 60 watts. I'd be really cautious about you know, using those with this board. In the past, I've had something like this where um, I by accidentally connected a 12 volt 40 watt heater up to 24 volts through one of these similar boards and drawing 160 watts through one of these boards essentially caused the MOSFET to immediately fail and I had a thermal runaway that ended up igniting the silicon sock and creating a small fire in my printer. So I don't say that to say these are unsafe because they're not, but be cautious about what you connect to them and be aware of their limitations. As we go around to the left, we can see um, that there is a micro USB connector on both of these. This is mainly used for flashing the device because at least for now, there is no CAN bootloader that allows us to flash the device over CAN. So whenever you need to flash the device, you plug in the USB connector, jumper um, across 3.3 volts and uh, the boot pin, which you can see here on the left in blue. And then on this right one, I actually already have <laughs> that boot uh, jumper applied. Then once you're done flashing it, you remove the boot jumper remove your USB cable um, and reset it and it's good to go. Going down to the next connector around uh, counterclockwise, we see we have an end stop connector on both of these. For the 0.5 zero, uh, 0 version, you can see there's just three pins, 3.3 uh, volt ground and the signal pin, which is pretty typical from what you'd expect. On the right, you see a five pin connector, which is a little bit unusual, unusual for end stops, but that's because they have given us three end stops on one connector. So there's five volts, zero volts, and then three signal pins. This allows us to use a probe connector, a X end stop connector, and say a filament sensor for um, ERCF. This is really exciting for me because in the past, I had used some of these debug pins, um, you know, over here and over here to uh, connect an additional end stop to on the 0 0.5 version, which isn't probably supported and it's probably risky and um, potentially damaging something, but I did it. <laughs> so um, now there's a much more robust solution with the 0 0.5 version having three end stops with the appropriate circuitry connected to them. Going to the bottom row, um, on the very left, we have the thermistor ports. For the 0 0.5 version, there's just a single thermistor port but for the 0 0.61, there's actually a ground and two signal pins. So this allows you to run a thermistor to your hot end, and then also a thermistor to a chamber thermistor. In this case, um, that's helpful because I've run that chamber thermistor separately on my 0 0.5 models, but now with the 0 0.61, I'll be able to integrate that into the tool headboard. The fans are fairly explanatory. Um, they are, the same as VN. So in this case, uh, 24 volts for VN means you should use 24 volt fans. Next, we have our hot end connector. This is a really small connector. Um, it requires a small jeweler's flathead screwdriver. Uh, these connectors, again, you're, are very small and um, just be double sure that the heater wires you're putting in, you know, don't have any stray kind of strands sticking out or anything like that that could short across the two. Um, you know, if you could fit a really tiny ferrule in there, that may be helpful as well. Um, I haven't been able to, I don't think I have ferrules quite small enough for that connector, but it's an option. Finally, we get around to the uh, stepper motor connector here, um, standard four pin 
uh, JST, similar to you'll see on a standard control board. Um, the rest of these connectors are a smaller type that are still really easy to crimp with uh, the typical Engineer PA09. The 0.61 version has the ADXL accelerometer built into it. So that's a really big benefit um, for that control board because every time I've had to put the accelerometer on my tool head up until now, you mount the sensor, you try to find the cable you made a few months ago and you can't find it, so you create it again. Um, and then you're always trying to figure out exactly what pins to put where. And it's just a pain. It, it takes maybe an hour for me to hook up the accelerometer after I've lost the wiring and stuff like that. With the accelerometer built into the 0.61 model, that's a huge benefit because you can just run the input shaper tuning process anytime you want. Um, say you loosen your belts and put them back on. Instead of just guessing at the tension, you can just run input shaper again and validate that everything is good to go. For installing the Clipper tool head board to Clipper, I'm not planning on going through a full step-by-step -step guide because there's such good documentation here on this CAN bus website and the Clipper documentation. Kevin did a great job detailing all the steps here, so I think if you follow this, you won't have an issue. Do note that if you have that WaveShare CAN hat, there are two versions, one with an 8 megahertz and one with a 12 megahertz crystal. You can just look at the device itself, um, look for something that's kind of oblong, um, and it should have an 8 or 12 on it, and um, you can pick the appropriate one. I've found sometimes that a bit rate of 500,000 may be a bit too high in certain cases, depending on which uh, model of WaveShare you have. So sometimes I run at 250,000 instead of 500,000, and I do not have issues with that. The slower maybe is a little bit more robust, maybe it's not the right way of doing it, but I found in some cases I need to run a slower bit rate. You need to specify it both uh, for the CAN interface and also in the make menu config when you configure your device. As far as terminating resistors here, the WaveShare hat has the um, 120 ohm resistor on its side. I have avoided putting the 120 ohm on the uh, Clipper tool headboard side. That's not probably the correct way of doing it and it's probably not as robust, but um, do know that you can at least get it functioning without that resistor. The final website you really want to become familiar with is the Clipper Toolboard GitHub itself. This has all of the assembly files for the different versions. If you come through here, um, this is the 0 0.5 version here and the uh, 0 0.61 version. As well, you can scroll down here and find the pinouts for some of the versions. Um, if you've noticed, I've actually created a uh, issue ticket here with the new pins for um, the 0 0.61 version. And the final thing is really to be sure of this clipper configuration. I uh, was bad and I was rushing through this when I got my new boards in. I was like, I have done this a million times. I probably had the correct settings from the last time. And I picked the wrong bootloader offset. This will brick your board. And the only way to recover it that I know of right now is to use an ST-Link um, and flash it uh, from your computer. If you have an ST-Link, great. It's not a big deal. It just takes a few minutes. If you do not have an ST-Link, you'll have to wait um, purchase one and, and learn how to use it. Um, so just a fair warning, be sure to pick the right bootloader offset. Just to make sure that you don't have any questions about this, we're gonna go through the make menu config uh, here. If you've set up Clipper before, you know exactly what we're looking at. Um, so again, this chip is an STM32 F103. Um, so that's the sele selection here. The bootloader offset is what I was talking about must select this option. Um, the very top option is the default, so you need to scroll down and select this one. The clock reference crystal, um, in this case, is different than your CanHat crystal. It is the reference for um, the Clipper tool head board itself, so make sure to select 8 megahertz here. And then the communication interface defaults to the very top here for USB, but since we're using CAN, we scroll down and pick this selection 
If you pick any of the other CAN bus options, it's not going to communicate properly. Finally, this is the CAN bus speed we were talking about before. You can try 500,000 on both um, settings here for your uh, controller, as well as on the Raspberry Pi side for your CAN interface. Whatever you do, make sure that both values match. If you drop it to 250,000 in one place, you must drop it to 250,000 in the other place. This video is a little longer than I expected, but let's wrap it up with talking about cost and how you can pick one of these boards up. First of all, cost, um, the original V0.5 uh, toolhead boards were around $25 a piece uh, from some suppliers like Luke's Lab. That was really cheap and all those prices are pre-pandemic. Um, since then, the V0.61, um, the latest batch was $65 a piece, which uh, when I checked out for two of them with included uh, connectors, it was painful. Um, I questioned whether I really needed another two of them. But if you think about the math, if you add up the $65 tool head plus the $15 can hat, that's still cheaper than a comparable, you know, $100 to $120 uh, wire harness for a Voron printer. If you do the wire harness yourself and DIY it, you can of course um, beat both of those prices, um, but you just have to uh, count in the value of your time doing all the crimping um, and wiring. In my experience, it's been at least a afternoon or a long day um, to wire up a, a printer and being able to just cut out a lot of that time with this tool head board has really saved me some time and I've considered it worth it. So the next batches that are available, I've heard um, Luke is uh, working on pre-orders, but I'm really hoping other manufacturers um, that can produce quality circuit boards will step in as well and start kind of improving the availability of these boards because right now it's really difficult to just purchase one. If you have any questions about this toolhead board in general, any questions about setting it up or anything like that, any suggestions for content, please feel free to leave a comment below um, and I'll kind of weigh it as I'm preparing my next videos. I really hope you enjoyed it and that you found this information useful. Until next time.